We've now got a panel. We're going to change gear again. This um, panel, I'm now, yes, this panel is on sound design, so I'm going to be very extra special careful about how close I get to the microphone because I've got <laughs> people either side who, you know, who are very sensitive to to the wrong sorts of sounds. I think. Um, so, uh, sound design, I've always thought, is a slightly misunderstood. Um, theme, which is why I wanted um, we wanted to do the panel on it, um, to do the session on it as part of the Craft Summit. Um, so my name's Christian Aurora. I've been moderating the day for those of you who haven't been in, in other sessions. Um, on the right, on my right, um, I've got Rana Eid, and Rana is from uh, uh, Beirut, Lebanon. She's a, a sound designer with her first film as a director called Panoptic, which was shown on Thursday... And it's being shown again on... Monday. On Monday. What, what time? 9 a.m. 9 a.m. <laughs> so, um, but it's a really excellent film, actually, and um, definitely worth, um, worth getting up for. It's uh, a, a really interesting film. We'll see some clips of it later, but I'd encourage you to watch the whole thing. Um, so she started working as a sound editor uh, back in 2003 and opened her own studios for audio post-production, um, called DB Studios um, in 2006. What does DB actually stand for? Is Deci it decibel? decibel yeah. yes. <laughs> I just said it and I realised. <laughs> stupid thing. Anyway, it, sounds, it stands for decibel. There you go. Um, uh, on my left, uh, um, uh, uh, Peter Albrechtsen is a sound designer from Copenhagen in Denmark. Uh, and his company is called uh, Lulromot, which means sound space. Um, and uh, Peter works across, this is really popping, isn't it? Um, Peter works across fiction and documentary, and along with um, uh, his sound work, he's also worked as a music supervisor, so we'll be covering a bit about music uh, later in the session. And the film um, he has here is, uh, with, uh, is a documentary with director um, Simon, Wilmot, Simon Lering Wilmot, The Distant Barking of Dogs, um, which has won multiple awards. Uh, it seems to have won every festival it's been in over the last um, few months, um, doing incredibly well. And uh, uh, so we're going to talk about both films. We're going to delve uh, as much as we can into what sound design is and how these two people go about their craft. And uh, as with all the sessions, and people have been very good at, great at coming up with questions, do think of questions... If there are things you want to contribute during the session, of course, please do that as well. There are uh, microphones um, in the room, uh, uh, and uh, you can ask those questions. So the first thing I wanted to come to was to get a sense of what sound design is. Um, how do you define it, and, and how is it different? How is the role of a sound designer different from uh, a dubbing mixer? So, Rana, do you, do you want to try that first, just to sum up? What is the role of a sound designer? Uh, I, I think for me, uh, sound design, um, the role of a sound designer is to, uh, I'm going to say it now, sorry, uh, it's uh, about creating the identity of the movie, uh, the, um, the other dimension uh, brought by the image and from the script. So the sound designer is writing a story itself, uh, in collaboration with the director. So I think um, the, the difference, if you want, it's not the sound, that it's, um, the sound is not following the image. Mm. It's telling things on, on its own. So uh, that's why I, I would, it's always better to, I prefer to, to begin the sound design during the script writing and talking with the director in much more in advance so we can think about things and create uh, identities and uh, other stories. Okay. And, and Peter, would you agree with that? Is there, um, you know, how do you, how do you see uh, sound? You've always worked in, in sound and also independently of making, of making films, haven't you? I think you, you told me recently you did an audio, an audio documentary. Yeah, I've, um, I think sound has so much amazing potential and in the uh, potential as storyteller and the emotional impact that it can have so um, I, I really l like to 
also try out other things, also experiment and do radio pieces. Mm. But I mean, mostly I do movies. Um, but for me, uh, sound is uh, such an uh, enormous part of making a movie a movie in a way, like creating the emotional um, uh, impact mm. of the film. Uh, and I totally agree that um, the earlier we can be part of the process, the better. Uh, so I'm also part of s the scripts and on documentaries. I I also try to be part of the, the process very early on um, because then sound can really be an integrated part of the film. And I, and I um, get the feeling that in Denmark, um, sound and sound design is really... Uh, it, within documentaries, it's it's very much part of the profession. It's well taught in film schools. It's respected. People ha always have sound designers in their in their budgets. Um, am I? Is that too idealistic a picture? Maybe not all documentaries, but yes, the, definitely a big part of kind of like the boom of Danish documentaries. I mean, Danish documentaries are doing very well and traveling the world and a lot of that is because the directors really respect the cinematic language mm -hmm. so they use visuals and sounds and music to really enhance their stories and to tell their stories so this idea that I mean uh, the journalistic documentary has in many years been very much about words and I feel that the amazing things about the development of documentaries is, is that now, of course, there's still words, but it's also about the silences and the moments where there's not any words being spoken. It's about the atmosphere and the poetry. So, um, thank you. And so, on a on a very basic level, sound design is a process before the final mix. Is it you? Sound design is about building up the layers of a film um, and then the mix brings them together. Is, is that correct? Is that a yeah, I mean, that, that, is, that is correct. That, uh, I mean, the, the, the whole um, uh, way of the method of working with sound has, has changed during the last 10 years because of computer programs and so on, making it possible to almost do mixing while mm. you are working but so there's not really that kind of a, 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 a border anymore between sound editing and mixing it's that was something that was right. more more here like 10 years ago but but still um, in many ways when you're doing the sound editing like if you compare it to the visual side of the film it's a little bit like the production designer creating all the different um, sets and props and finding everything how should this film look and then in the mixing it's like the photographer coming in and then finding out okay which parts of this should we then focus right. on right. Um, okay um, good I, when, when we put these two um, films together I realise there is quite a similar there's a, they, they're, they're covering some similar ground um, in a way, and the, 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 the use of sound in them um, plays a similar role, perhaps. I mean, uh, Rana's film is about the... Uh, or is reflecting, perhaps, on, on the, the civil war in Lebanon, which was, you said, 1975 Five. to about 1990? 1990, yeah. Um, so 15 years, so in the, in the past, and... Uh, uh, the Distant Barking of Dogs, the film that Peter worked on, um, is about a, a, a war in the eastern Ukraine that is present but not the subject of the film. Um, so I'd like you both to, to, to reflect on that. I mean, Rana, first, you grew up uh, in Lebanon during that time, didn't you? Um, uh, is this is is do you think this film is your way of recovering some of that or, or exploring it yeah because well, I, I grew up so I was uh, like my first 15 years was during the war because I was born in 76 so 
this was my ho my only memory war. Uh, and for me, yes, it was very therapeutic in a way because uh, I, I, when I was finding the, when I, when I decided to do this film, I discovered that our illnesses resembles a lot the illnesses of the city. And, uh, Sorry, our illnesses? Yeah, and our inner, inner uh, problems resembles a lot the problem of Beirut, especially, no, it's my experience, and still Beirut has a lot of troubles until now, so uh, not maybe the same violence, but we have a lot of political problems. For those, uh, those illnesses we have, we, have a, we are a whole generation of ill people in a way. We're fine, <laughs> but uh, no, okay. we have our sicknesses and our allergies and our asthma attacks and everything, and it resembles the city. And uh, yani for example, when I was six, I used to record sounds in the shelters, and I didn't know what this means to me. Be uh, now I understood that I was as doing this to, to keep alive. So if I can hear my voice and the voices and the sounds of the shelters, I would feel that I'm still alive. And then when I grew up and when I discovered that this can be my career, <laughs> I was very happy. <laughs> so war uh, did something good. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, I think now would be, good, would be a good moment to show um, a clip from uh, from the film, from Rana's film. This um, is uh, towards the beginning of the film. Um. Um, excellent. Yes. Thank you. And I, I um, I've seen the, the clip a few times, and, and that time I uh, I, I tried um, just experiencing it with my eyes closed. And it was a very <laughs> interesting experience, actually, because you are so used to um, watching films, and I probably said, well, watch the clip, but actually uh, it's uh, a, a film that really operates on the sonic level, that, yeah. that, that sequence, doesn't it? And I remember you saying to me very early on um, that you, uh, you, know, you, you conceived the, the sound for the film before you thought about what the images might be. Yeah. Do, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Uh, because it was a very difficult uh, process because this whole space, is, uh, this location uh, are forbidden to be, uh, we can't shoot them, so the permits are very, very uh, difficult to have. So uh, we had very few uh, hours to shoot in many locations, so uh, to feel the space, uh, I was talking with my DOP and we were talking a lot beforehand and uh, so I c so so the sound when I put the mics in different places and uh, I took some sounds of the acoustics and the specifics of the place I could feel the place more and uh, so I can know I I knew better where to put the camera and where to uh, and how to film mm -hmm. so it's it was after I heard the sp the sound of the space I could find my way to put cameras and to discuss quickly with the DOP. And then I did that um, during the editing, uh, in the post-production, I did the sound design, the first layer of sound design before I did the montage, the editing. So I wa because I wanted to feel the rhythm of the film before and the rhythm and the feeling of the locations and uh, this void and the acoustics and the out of sync, uh, the, the, the synchronicity problem in the whole city and especially in these locations. So uh, we built the image on the sound. And then after we did the editing, I redid uh, a layer of sound design, but this was the whole process. Excellent. Um, and I think, well, let, let's move on to, to, um, uh, to see something of distant barking, so that, sorry, so that we can um, really do a proper compare and contrast. Um, do you want to set up, Peter, just where we are in the film when we look at this next clip? Um, or, or, or tell us about the, the, the character, because we may not be seeing him so clearly at the beginning. Yeah, we have, we have, we have, um, so this, this film takes place on kind of the border between Ukraine and, and Russia, and there's this ongoing war in the distance. And then we follow two boys, so those are the ones we follow in this clip. Um, they live with their grandmother, but in this clip they're out um, in the field. 
Great. I, th I think that, that that's probably all we need to know um, to uh, to listen to uh, and perhaps watch this clip. So let's play um, Peter's first clip, please. I, th I think in that one we are um, the the sound design for me puts us in a similar position to the to the boys. We're trying to work out what's what's going on, aren't we? And we're we're almost seeing somebody listening um, around the bonfire. Is was that was that how how um, you and and Simon the director uh, imagined the scene? Is that is that what its role is? Yeah, uh, Simon, the director, was, I mean, he, he was over there, like, shooting for, like, a long, long period of time. So he got very used to the sound of the bombings. So a sequence like this, I mean, the only sound that is actually from the, from the shoot um, is the voices. So the rest of everything you hear is built up afterwards. And uh, because everything is shot on just, like, small radio mic, microphones and a uh, and a, a rusty old microphone on the camera so uh, we had to build up everything so uh, we recorded all these specific types of weapons that they were using and then Simon for for a scene like this he he did it like a map of all the sounds of all the bombings so he knew exactly because he had been there so much he knew the the exact sound of how it sounded when a grenade was shot from the opposite side and how it sounded when it hit close to you and what, how it sounded if it hit far from you. And then he also knew from the Ukrainian side how it sounded like if they fired a gun and when, how it sounded when it hit over there. So each, every bomb sound you hear in this was planned out. So we made a map of, of, a, of, a, of a sequence like this for every bomb sound, how it should sound, how much delay and how much decay and how close it should be and how much bass and to to get, give you this feeling of really being there. It was immensely important that this felt real, even though it's not real at all in a way. Like it's real for them, but the sounds are something that we applied. And, and so we had to be extremely focused on like really recreating this um so uh, so those 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 um sounds of, of mortar explosions and grenades and all of whatever else there was and heavy weapons those are authentic sounds but they weren't recorded at the time or they were recorded but not well and you then re-recorded them yeah i, I mean on me on you if you hear the production sound the sound from the shoot then you hear because there's, there's nothing left of that. Um, so, uh, yeah, we, we, uh, we found out that in Finland, where, where half of the sound team for this film is based, they, uh, they used the same kind of weapons. So we were able to go out and record there without being, I mean, without it being dangerous for our lives. That's, that's pretty incredible, I think. Um, uh, in terms of getting, in terms of how you, the lengths that you go to 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 create the sound picture, and uh, I was sort of feeling every um, every explosion there. So it, it obviously had an effect. Um, uh, and uh, Rana, you as you as well were saying that um, uh, you know you recorded sounds for a particular emotional effect. I think at one point in the film, um, without giving it away, there's a sort of dance party scene and you said you wanted a particular sound and you recorded it in a particular way yeah it was a uh, it was a ceremony for the army and uh, for me the ceremony was very uh, revolting so uh, I wanted to uh, I wanted to have uh, the sound distorted and I, I did a challenge for myself uh, in this film so I didn't want to put any effects in post-production any reverb I wanted to have this to, if I want reverb, I will record reverb. If I want distortion, I will record it distorted. So I didn't want uh, the army people to have dynamics and I wanted to oppress them like they oppress us. So I want to oppress them with sound. So I decided to take the sound with the iPhone only. 
So we were, I was alone, the cameraman was shooting, and I was uh, recording all the sounds of the ceremony with my iPhone distorted. Very, yeah, I was doing everything technically wrong, every technical mistake, because <laughs> I wanted to, to the sound to be trashy and uh, distorted and uh, ugly like that. Sorry, I'm not. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I mean, it's, it's, it, I mean, it's, it's, um, it's very uh, sophisticated, layered sound, and it's interesting that you were recording it in in that way. Um, one of the other layers that's used sparingly in in both of your films, and I think we've all well, is is music, and I think um, certainly from my perspective in working for television a lot. Um, Music is, is something that we perhaps overuse on television. I don't, want, don't know what everybody else feels about that. Perhaps we can cover that in the questions. But the, it is a bit of a feature in, in both of these films that you use music uh, not to fill space, but for a particular narrative effect, don't you? And um, um, I think the music in your film is only in two or three places and, and um, it is there for... A, I think you said it was, for, yeah, it was for a particular moment uh, in the film. Do you want to describe yeah, that? Yeah, I wanted to. The music was the role of the music in the film was to say my uh, incapacity of doing anything in front of the situation we we have. So, at, uh, I used the music at the beginning of the film to introduce the city, and it was uh, like uh, it was between. It was very uh, similar to sounds. So we 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 did. Some music concrete uh, with and and prepared piano and uh, okay. so it was uh, very similar to sounds and uh, then in the middle in the detention center in the prison there's because uh, at some point you feel hopeless that this prison will remain like this and those people are there and you can do anything so I put a piece of music it's like uh, me saying I I'm, I'm sorry I can't do anything you, you called and it a you called it a lamentation exactly uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, at the end I'm saying uh, that I'm going up un from underground and uh, there's a uh, the sentence that my father uh, said to me and uh, so this is like uh, I was mourning my father. I I, I did my mourning. I, uh, I I did my therapy, and uh, I'm saying goodbye to him. So, uh, so that was the three moment. I didn't want to be very emotional in a way. I wanted to be sensational more, sensation than emotion. Uh, that's an interesting distinction, I think. And, and and Peter, I know when you were when you were talking with Rana earlier, she she also spotted that there was. The music was used very, very sparingly in the film, and, and I mean, when you when you do get to see the film, you'll you'll see that it's a very um, sparse film in a way. You know, there's there's not huge amount of, of action, and the temptation might be to use lots of music, but you resisted that temptation, didn't you? You you are also a music supervisor, I think. So. You understand the role of music. Tell us what you think music can do to a film and perhaps sometimes why you should avoid it. I mean, music is amazing and uh, uh, it's, it's a really, really powerful tool. But precisely because of its power, it can sometimes be overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And I feel that it can sometimes take emotions away from something that is emotional already and um, something that we generally try to do um, uh, also in Distant Bark and Dogs was to if when, if when the music comes in then it's not to create an emotion it's more to build, an, uh, build on an emotion that was already there and we do it often very sparingly, like also in Renner's film, where you feel like the music kind of seeps out of the sounds in a way. And it grows from... So saying music concrete. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like this feeling, which I really love, where you, we're not, you're not really sure when did this music actually start. It's kind of like you're flowing into the music. And, um, and uh, that's something that we did a lot on, on Distant Barking of Dogs. Okay, um, and, and so you've, you've um, 
brought a couple of clips is actually the same visuals, and we'll listen to both of them. One is um, the full soundtrack, um, and the other is with the music removed. So, mm. you know, it's just, let's call it, a, excuse me, a listening exercise, and we'll see afterwards, and maybe can get some reactions from the audience, which one uh, works, or whether, whether you do think it, the, the music's necessary. So can we play the first, the, the, um, the clip called Voice Over All? A, a very interesting exercise, actually, to, uh, because for, for me, um, I don't know, is any, before I say it, is, does, does somebody want to respond to the difference um, between those clips? Anybody? Yeah, the lady in the front, so if you could uh, just wait, just wait for the microphone. Thank you. I, I don't think you need the music. You don't think you need because the music? Because I think we're attuned to sort of parking our emotions inside music. So once you pull out the music, then you're forced to be in the space and hear in a much more alert way. And then when you're reading the information, it's much more um, tragic. Mm. Any, anybody else have a different view? Yes, so there's um, somebody at the, at, the, at the back. There's a mic down there as well. Ah. Uh, you might have to press the button up or just check that it's on. I thought it's on already. Okay. Um, yeah, for me, the music turned the attention away a bit. So it was, um, I don't know, in the, in the second one, um, I think the senses were more um, intense mm. because it was not that overload <laughs> and uh, I could dive better in this. Uh, yeah, it was more intense without, mm. I think, for me. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, I think maybe Maybe in, in, in terms of music, do you, um, is, was, did, obviously it changes by project to project, but um, is your temptation now to do, as a sound designer, to use less music because you can build up um, rhythms and some sort of, a, you know, mu I don't know if it's a musical feel, but themes through sound effects um, instead of, you know, a plaintive violin or, or a cello or whatever, the, the, or a piano note theme? It, uh, it changes a lot from project to project, that's really true. Um, for, for music, I often feel like, I mean, now we're just seeing the sequence, but I often feel like it's something that you have to see the whole movie to get a kind of a feeling of how should the music play. Mm. And, um, um, I feel that um, for a film like this, these, this, this that we just saw is like kind of like these small kind of more abstract pieces that's inside the film as it comes like four or five times. Otherwise, we are in this very realistic space with these two boys. Mm -hmm. And it felt like when watching the whole film that we needed to kind of make those islands in the film different than the other parts where there's very very little music so that's why the music is there when i hear it like now it's also like if i if we had just done this as the film then it wouldn't have had music but sure. but it's 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 sure. interesting how i've i mean i've music really is is um talking to the to the emotions but it can also really drown out the emotions as, and as somebody said out there yeah exactly so we and it's definitely something to be very very uh, aware about mm. and i wanted to move on to the last bit before we then take some take some questions um uh, and and to to show um rana's um second clip or second clip from rana's film and it's about, um, you, you said to me that I think you, for, for you, sound is really linked to, the, to collective memory. And uh, uh, this particular scene is about um, what is still maybe a, a hidden memory in a 
relatively hidden place mm -hmm. um, in the middle of Beirut. So, um, which is the Beirut Hotel, maybe, do you want to say just a few words about what that hotel was? I'm not sure if it, I mean, maybe it does say it on the caption. Yeah, yeah. I think it says it on the caption, so we'll yeah. just play the, um, we'll just play that, uh, the second of Rana's clip. So that really quite an overwhelming experience. <laughs> uh, and, and I can obviously, for, for you having lived through that, if you can sort of sum up maybe what, what, were there, what was there, the, the atmosphere that you were looking to create um, uh, about that? And uh, apologies for interrupting the cl clip. No. Just I knew some people couldn't um, read the subtitles um, from your voiceover. No. So w what was the atmosphere you were looking to create with, those, with that sound picture? Uh, this uh, location b comes at the end of the, more or less at the end of the film, and uh, this location, uh, we no no one w no one was allowed to shoot before, so we were the first people to to get there b after the war. So and uh, this and I didn't know at the time when we were filming where to put this location in the film, but uh, when I was down, it was it's downstairs. It it has five floors underground. Um, I realized that uh, that the civil war, the, the we didn't go out from the shelters. The civil war is still within us. There's the traces, the unsaid, the undead people down there. So it was like so that that's when I decided th this whole sounds are uh, sounds from the place, with no effects. Even uh, only we we we, we slam doors and those are the booms we we had. But uh, I wanted, I worked with the layers. It's like layers, layers of problems and something we hide and we hide a problem and, uh, and, and another problem. So we, ha we have layers of problems and layers of unsolved business. And this was the identity that I wanted to show this with, uh, with sound. So I put layers, 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 layers at sound and it becomes like chaos at the end. Uh, no, we, we can't hear anything, so we can't solve anything. So uh, that's why I always work sound and identity, and uh, that's it. Wonderful, thank you, thank you. So um, let's open it up to some, I mean, questions and reflections. Um, uh, so there's a question went up straight at the back, lady in the blue top, and then we'll take the gentleman at the front on the right, and then lady in the check shirt. Hi there. Um, my question is to Peter, and um, it's on, say, the honesty of sound design. So it was particularly in relation to something you said earlier, where you mentioned that you wanted the um, viewer to feel the experience of how it was to be there, but then that you recorded the sounds in uh, Finland, so they're more dramatic. So I'm just wondering, do you feel that, that takes it more into drama or an authentic documentary? I'm just curious to hear your comments on that. Um, I feel that the uh, authenticity is immensely overrated. I don't agree. <laughs> I feel that there's something called emotional authenticity which we should think much more about and not worry too much about the authenticity of realism because there is no nothing that's really real because as soon as we put up the camera and we point it in a specific direction we already b made a very subjective choice of what to film and how to shoot it and as soon as you put a microphone on the camera uh, it records the world in a sp very specific way that's not real anymore so for me um, I'm really 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 spending a lot of time on making it feel real and I spend a lot of time on I mean we we got hold of a sound recordist from the area who recorded specific ambiences from different times of year to have the actual ambiences from the place um, so I mean I spend a lot of time on authenticity in that sense but I really don't spend too much time on thinking um, the f the sound recording was like this. Then let's not add anything because I feel that that is very untrue. Actually, I don't feel that's authentic at all. I feel that our 
our uh, what is important for us as storytellers is to make decisions on what story we want to tell and what the character is feeling and to make that vision come alive. Uh, so uh, that's something that re- I spend so much time on, but uh, it's it's an interesting discussion, but uh, I just feel that uh, there's a potential there that in uh, like how we visually and sonically tell our stories in documentaries that are sometimes like uh, um, sometimes like uh, uh, hold we hold back on things that we don't need to hold back on and Excellent. that doesn't mean that it can't be minimal but it's just uh, the, the, our approach to to storytelling Excellent, thank you. Uh, so the gentleman in the middle on the blue uh, T-shirt. Hi. Um, I'm a film editor, and I'd be interested to know your experiences of how edits have changed once uh, sound designers, once you come on board. I know sometimes you're there from the very beginning, um, but a shot can be sustained for a lot longer with really compelling sound design, and some of the choices that might have been made without that sound design there would have been different with it being there. So it has the edit changed, have you gone back into um, an offline once the sound design has, has begun or have you had to, have you had very much creative input into um, the way the story's been crafted if you've come at it at the very end of the process? Uh, can, can, can I, because the accent is... Uh, that's all right. I mean, so the, the, the que- that's all right. No, the, question, um, the question was, uh, do you find that once you've worked on the sound design of a film, that it then changes, it can change something about the edit, that the editor, this gentleman's a film editor, so if you, you know, is there a feeling that by doing the sound design you're uncovering parts to the film where you then need, as I understand it, you then need to sort of change the edit, actually, because the sound is bringing up things yeah, that, yes. that, that uh, making shot, you know, enabling shots. Yeah, to exactly. We, we always have this discussion, and the, because we, w- technically the conforming and redoing uh, the conforming of a film is very time-consuming and it's uh, tiring, but uh, it, uh, 99% of the t- of times we change the edit after the sound design because of the rhythm, the rhythm of uh, some scenes, and some scenes have no sense after we do sound design, so they remove them. Now I'm working on a film, for example, the director removed all this scene because he had, he thought maybe sound, the scene was bad, but he thought, he thought maybe sound would solve the problem, but I, I couldn't, so, <laughs> so he removed So we took it out. Just a oh. very so quick thing, yeah. just this sequence that we saw from Distant Barking of Dogs, that was actually like we did the sound design while they were picture editing, and then they changed the picture edit. It's a sequence that's so based on sound that you couldn't edit it mm. before you had the sound. Okay, and then we've got the, the question in the middle there, um, in the check shirt. And then there might be time for one more. Yeah, this is for Peter. It's a lot like uh, the first question that was asked. Uh, it's maybe you could talk more about um, the ethics of adding something onto a scene. Uh, that wasn't originally there. Um, do you ever feel that there's an instance where adding something specifically already removes the truthfulness of it? Or is it kind of all the same to you creatively? I mean, I think, I, to be honest, I think Peter's responded yeah. to that quite well. I'm not, um, not sure what else there is to add. I mean, maybe, uh, maybe Rana, do you have a view on that? Do you think... There is something like, um, you know, is it is it is it right to add sound to a soundtrack that might not have been there? I totally agree with uh, Peter about authenticity. And uh, Herzog once said uh, that uh, if we want to be authentic, uh, being authentic between brackets, it's like having a surveillance camera. We're not police, we're not pu- putting camera with nothing and just see- seeing whatever it is. Uh, we have to put, uh, to put our inputs and uh, 
This is from the perspective I work. It's like coll collective memories. It's not only one point of view. It's different point of views. And adding sounds put adds points of views, and we can discuss it more. I think it's m my opinion. <laughs> well, look, I th um, my red light is flashing. I'm terribly sorry. Um, that's all we've got time for in this session. Um, so thank you. Can you join me in, in giving a big hand to Rana and Peter? Thank you.